Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues and friends from across the world. I am deeply honored to welcome you all to the third annual World Health Congress in the captivating city of Prague. Whether you are here with us in person or joining us virtually from various corners of the globe, your presence marks a significant moment in our shared commitment to advancing global health. I would like to introduce the man without whom we wouldn't be here today, the visionary and the driving force behind this Congress, Tomáš Pfeiffer. Thank you. Tomáš Pfeiffer is a philosopher, biotronist, director of Senator Chamber, and Institute for TCIM and CAM, advocate for UNESCO Heritage, the Society of Josef Zazulka representative. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you for an introduction. As uh, I consider this Congress very important, I would like to read uh, my speech so as not to forget anything. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my great honor to welcome you on behalf of the Institute uh, for TCIM to the World Health Congress 2023 Prague. The Congress is being held under the auspices of the Prague City Hall and Professor Dr. Julius Pichak, head of the Hepatogastroenterology Clinic of the Institute of Clinical and Experimental Medicine, member of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. Professor Špičák, let me express my thanks to you. Thank you for your presence. My thanks also rightfully go to all participants of the Congress, members and guests of the Presidium, presenters and viewers. So, welcome to Prague, to this Congress. In rapidly changing times, which bring new, hitherto unknown challenges, such as climate change, new diseases, and many others, there is a historical necessity to unite in an all-human effort to face these challenges. This applies to all of us, regardless of education, nationality, or social status. We are passengers on the same ship. The World Health Congress is a global interdisciplinary health project bringing together all TCIM modalities. Not least with the aim of creating a space for collaboration with evidence-based medicine. And this bringing uh, much needed help to patients. At the moment, the public interest in our disciplines is growing significantly. And it is not only this that leads us to the idea of joining forces with open minds and hearts in an all-round effort. Only in this way can we realize a holistic form of health care and work on the development of health policies and the spirit of the resolutions of international regulators that recommend investigation of TCIM disciplines and their integration in national health systems. 
Our Congress is being attended by a representative of an all-party parliamentary group at the UK Parliament and representatives of many national and international organizations such as Eurocam, BA. MC, ANMI, SALUS, EUAA, RCCM, NCAM, AYUSH, NHFC, WHO, INDICA, EAA, MCPHI, IMAVF, ITSIM, and others. It is clear from this list of uh, organizations that a significant number of TCIM experts are meeting in Prague today on a global scale. During the Congress, um, the open document uh, of the vision 2023 Prague project will be jointly approved, focusing on global free cooperation to ensure safe care for all those in need and to create the conditions for policy making, education, research and publication necessary for the development of TCIM modalities. I wish you to gain a lot of valuable information in the next few days about the research and status of TCIM on a national and international level on a global scale and thus contribute to raising the awareness of the general and professional public. Uh, today we can find more than 18,000 highly informative studies of a wide range of TCIM modalities in the prestigious medical databases Cochrane and PubMed. The term evidence-based therefore no longer applies only to Western medicine, but increasingly also to TCIM disciplines of the East and West. Thank you once again, and I welcome you to the Congress and wish success to all presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Let the Congress make flowers. The Congress will grow and with multicolors and everything. Thank you. Thank you very much for your effort. Very nice. Very nice, Nora. Okay. Uh. Vítám vedle ostatních členů předsednictví. I also welcome besides the presidium members uh, thanks to this lovely gift uh, especially Nora Laubstein who is the president of the Association for Natural Medicine in Europe and me. Thank you once more. A mám ještě jednu prozbu. And uh, I would Ty like uh, to say one more thing. Uh, those of you who are following us on uh, the internet, please share this opportunity uh, with um, the others so that it can spread as much as possible all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tomasz for a beautiful opening speech and to continue the opening ceremony I would like to ask uh, Dr. Julius Spichak to come up and speak up. Dr. Julius Spichak is a leading Czech gastroenterologist, director of hepatoenterology at ICAM, parliament member and award-winning researcher. Thank you very much. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, uh, several unformed words, but by heart. So thank, first, I have to say that uh, I'm very pleased that I'm here, because still, because uh, even in my, let's say, advanced age, I love to learn something, and here's the place where I can learn something. First, what I am surprised is, from the beginning, 
very polite, extremely polite behavior and attitude of, of all the members, uh, including, the, uh, including the staff. I am very, very pleasantly surprised because otherwise all of us feel that the society basically is very nervous and frustrated and so, so probably there is one of the very positive influence of this kind of alternative medicine, very high politeness of all people here. So this is uh, what I appreciate. Uh, let's uh, to introduce myself, as it was uh, told, as it was said, I am head of the, one of the biggest department of a very important specialty. Uh, so this is the diseases of the abdomen. And uh, let's say, uh, one moment, uh, we provide the background for 150 liver transplantations per year. This is the, one of the most active departments in all the Europe. And I have to say that uh, to, uh, to provide liver transplantation is uh, very, uh, I would say this is, very, um, this is the most empathic probable issue because everybody has the chance, everybody has the chance. No influence, doesn't make any, any influence whether you are rich or, or poor, whether you are a politician or not. So very empathic, very empathic, very empathic field. Uh, so, and also I am a member and for 30 years, I've been the member of uh, several uh, national and international uh, uh, research uh, agencies. So I have, to, I have to say, let's say modestly, that I know how to make the research. And to make the research, evidence-based research, is very, it's becoming more and more complicated. And the logistic is very, very complicated. And this is one of the reasons why there are not so many really highly, uh, really high, uh, high scientific papers in the field of the, of, the, uh, of the alternative medicine. So to prepare my lecture, I learned a lot about the alternative medicine. Uh, paradoxically, I have selected uh, the issue of inflammatory bowel disease, and I am not expert in inflammatory uh, bowel diseases. And of course, that I am not expert in any kind of the, uh, of the alternative medicine but uh, I will do my best. I learn a lot and I will do my best. Just for illustration, so we have the evidence-based medicine. I am always saying, this is, let's say, uh, one of my uh, favorite burn modes, that the medicine in the, on the, is on the first politics, on the second business, and on the third little bit also the health. So, and, but both these things, let's say the politics and the business, has the great influence, unfortunately, on, the, on, on how uh, the medicine is provided. And I will tell you just one statistic showing the weakness, demonstrating the weakness of the traditional medicine. Uh, by official statistics, in the United States, the first reason of the mortality are cardiovascular diseases, of course. The second, on the second place, uh, they are, this is oncology. And on the third place is medical error. Medical error on the third position, third position. It's showing the weakness, the weakness of how the medicine, how the standard medicine is organized and how it's provided. And this is a big advantage of the alternative medicine because it's bringing completely different approach. One, let's say, uh, one of the very important features is that it's very safe. According to my opinion, according to my opinion, what I learned, it's very safe. So, okay, once again, uh, welcome to Prague. Enjoy the meeting, and for me, a uh, big pleasure to be here with you and challenge to be you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Spichak. Uh, Dr. Spichak dove right in. <laughs> and to continue our opening ceremony, I would also like to invite uh, to speak up um, Isabel Wachsmuth from Switzerland. She is the project manager at the World Health Organization in Geneva, focusing on health, sustainability, and art. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Um, I'm sorry, uh, maybe we can switch the microphones. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay now. <laughs> That's good. Um, before we begin, I would also a little note. I noticed that not everybody is using the translation, um, st translating stations. If anybody would like to take advantage um, of hearing the speech in uh, Czech, English or German, um, it is available at the table over there. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to all of you. And uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be with uh, you today. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it is an honor uh, and specifically to have this uh, uh, opportunity to discuss together about <laughs> traditional and complementary medicine. Um, I am working uh, in one very interesting department in WHO, enfin World Health Organization. It is a department in charge of integrated health uh, services. Uh, and under uh, this type of concept, uh, you have, of course, integration. And that includes traditional and complementary medicine but as well uh, the work on uh, patient engagement. Um, we have uh, heard uh, this issue of medical errors, you know, from the dysfunctioning of health systems. Look, it's, uh, it's about how uh, we are looking as well, how we engage the patient in a center approach uh, manner, uh, and as well how we will uh, be able in WHO to identify, to map, over the world, what are the country or um, health systems, for example, the hospital or healthcare, healthcare center, are the most uh, advanced, in fact, to uh, design uh, integrated health services, in fact. Now that it is really uh, what I am doing now with my colleague from my department, and uh, in this regard, we are uh, including uh, the concept of social prescribing. So it is uh, how we can consider as well non-medical approach for well-being and to uh, prevent, in fact, disease. Uh, social prescribing is including uh, community engagement, for example, not just patient engagement, but community engagement. So how we uh, are able to um, interact with general public to uh, give them the appetite to maintain uh, their good health. And that includes uh, many activities of traditional and complementary medicine, like uh, physical uh, activities, uh, um, but as well uh, art. I will, I will mention that in, uh, in my... Um, presentation tomorrow about art activities, how that is very beneficial as well to um, interconnect all the different stakeholders to have better understanding of uh, not just the disease, but how we can be all together uh, in, um, in this aspect of well-being. Uh, and the, the idea, it is very important, it is not to, to have opposition between, uh, you know, uh, traditional me medical, you know, aspect and traditional complementary medicine, but it is how we are able uh, to recognize the importance of each disciplines and, and, and to integrate, in fact, all these disciplines for the best uh, of our uh, health as humanity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Isabel Waxmuth from Switzerland. Um, and now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome um, Amarjit S. Pamra, um, the catalyst in UK-India relations, advocate, lecturer, Ayurveda ambassador, promoting bilateral soft power ties, indicator of European petition for access to traditional medicine. Welcome, Amarjit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thomas. So, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. Dober, Doberdan? Something like that, yeah. Okay, um, where is Markita? Oh, not here. Okay. Okay, okay. So, um, so, I've been here for something like 16 hours. I arrived yesterday morning from London. And I've already put on uh, nearly one kilo of weight. <laughs> Thank you for the absolutely, absolutely fantastic food and the cakes. I never knew uh, the cakes and confectionery in Czech Republic was that great. <laughs> so um, I... Um, um, based in London, and I have the privilege of working with Madanji and Peter here from Germany, and uh, all our amazing friends here on the panel, and um, and also with uh, Tom Thomas and uh, Ludmilla and um, Markita, who have been coming so very graciously, you know, to the programs that we arrange in the UK Parliament as well as the European Union Parliament. And uh, so we have had a, a good working relationship for five, six years now, and I'm very pleased to be here with all of you today and, and share some of my thoughts um, today and, and hopefully tomorrow. So uh, way back uh, 2014, the European Union created um, a directive basically banning all herbal traditions in, in the European Union. So the idea was that how do we, you know, work towards, um, you know, combating that situation. So um, with some of my political connections back in the UK, we put together um, a, um, um, a meeting of all herbal traditions, not just Ayurveda, not just Indian traditional uh, sciences, but also to TCM, Tibetan medicine, African medicine, even Western medicine, yeah? So we got really the whole, the whole network of all the herbal traditions together. And the idea was to how do we discover that the, the medicines that have been, that have been protecting uh, and have been there for the welfare of humans, and the, 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 those very medicine systems are th under threat. So who's going, to save the, who's going to save the medicines? So that, that is... Uh, uh, that was the turning point, and so we then sort of engineered a um, saveherbalmedicine.com campaign, and within about a month and a half, we generated uh, nearly over one million signatures, which we then presented to the um, government in the United Kingdom, led by David Cameron. So we are now, ladies and gentlemen, you see, if we don't ask, we don't get. Simple as that. So we are now in a very privileged position in the United Kingdom, having to fight for what we feel we need, is that we can import fresh or dry Ayurveda herbs you know, from India. So we, we, we have reached you know, that milestone. And, uh, and still, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. And um, <clears throat> then we went on to set up um, a very powerful group of, now in this group there are almost 30 members of parliament in the United Kingdom. And so they are from both houses of Houses of Lords and Houses of Commons, and it's a cross-party group. So we have all the parties involved in this. And so the idea is, is that how can we utilize the, um, those very powerful corridors of power to actually make the government understand that we must have a choice of freedom in our health and our wellness, yeah? So if we, you know, if I live in England and I dress like this, yep, so I'm not an Englishman, yeah? I'm still Indian by my faith, by my, uh, my culture, my food, and many things, but 
although I have a British identity, I have a British citizenship. So if I can do all this in England, so and people can eat what they want. So when it comes to our own health and well-being, why must we only be able to take pharmaceutical medicine and not others? So on the strength of that, we put um, a very powerful group together. Initially, it was only about three members of parliament. Now, with the grace of the universe, we have 30 members of parliament who are fighting to, uh, to, for the government to understand the legitimization of traditional medicine in the United Kingdom. We were at one time working also in the EU Parliament, but unfortunately this uh, divorce took place. Yeah? You understand the divorce, yeah? The, the, the Brexit. And so we are now very slowly um, coming back. Um, we have been invited back into, into the European Union Parliament. We had a series of meetings and uh, working formidably uh, forward. Uh, and, and most of our work now is, is, uh, is based on um, policy making, but also research. So we are involved very deeply with research, and I look forward to speaking to you about that tomorrow, and also about research and our research endeavors here on the continental Europe. So. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me here. An absolute pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amarjeet. Our next uh, member of the presidium that I would like to call to speak up will be Dr. Madan Tangavelu, um, the genome biologist at Cambridge expert in diverse fields from genetics to Ayurveda, linked with Mind Matter Unification Project at Cavendish Lab. Dr. Mann. Thank you. Thank you. I, hope, I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for having all of us here. Thank you, sir, for having all of us here. And thanks to members of the Presidium for joining us. Peter, thank you for being here with us today, everybody. Uh, it's a delight to be here. This is, uh, I've been to this place many times now, and it's an honor to be here again. Uh, this was visualized by Thomas. We discussed about this for many years, and now it has happened. And the whole world is able to join us from different corners of the world, wherever they are. Uh, uh, this is the 70th anniversary being celebrated in Cambridge for the discovery of DNA. It's only 70 years ago that we understood what is DNA. In 70 years, it has touched all the corners of um, life, biology, biology research. Before 70 years, we did not know what this was. What is the next big question in biology? we are left with this problem. And this is a big problem. And that, I, in my mind, the next big horizon where biology needs to go is something that is being shown to us by Thomas. Uh, there is something there that holds this body together, both in health and when things go wrong, there is something, a change in this body. There is so much, only so much you can learn with modern biology techniques. And just like with DNA 70 years ago, where we didn't know about DNA, there is something waiting to be discovered. And for me, this is that one area where we will discover. And Thomas has touched on this about evidence the evidence is here. And I hope that more of the academic community can be pulled towards this thinking. But to bring them to us, we unfortunately need the help of politics. And politics needs the help of economics. And oh, fortunately, unfortunately, we need the help. And we need to bring several new forces to play on this, to make that leap. And 
we are at that point where, as a community, we are starting to feel the need for connecting with politics. In the Czech Republic, there is an Academy of Sciences. There are knowledgeable academicians who understand the physics behind this, the mathematics behind this. But somehow, our message is not going through. We are very lucky you are here with us today. And I hope we will make a very serious effort to take this message to the parliamentarians, not only in the Czech Republic, but the neighboring countries, to Brussels. Amajit Ji has already helped hold two events in the European Parliament on two Ayurveda days. And I hope we can take this message onwards. There is a WHO center already established in India, in the state of Gujarat. And last uh, few weeks, two weeks ago, they had the first convention to discuss traditional medicine. And I hope our voice will be heard there. And I hope that uh, a more dialoguing about this. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Antonetta, who's discussing yoga and aspects of yoga in the community. And everyone in this presidium is contributing in a big way. But to amplify that message, sir, we look to you to guide us, take us forward. Thank you. It is important that all the disciplines work together. Thank you so much, Dr. Tangavelu. And uh, as a next member of the Presidium, I would like to welcome Nora Laubstein from Germany. She is the president of Association of Natural Medicine in Europe, traditional German naturopath since 1995, studied ethnology, and she has been honored for environment and democracy. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. yeah, first of all, I say ahoy. This is very important, and I thank all the members of the chamber here for coming, all you for uh, being interested in our topic. And our organization, the Association for Natural Medicine in Europe, is on the way since 2001. And uh, we have learned a lot about European uh, conditions, the European Commission and all this uh, uh, framework of regulation. And my uh, um, motivation was uh, from working with the patients, go to the European Parliament and bring the message in. So this is idealistic, utopic, I know but it's uh, necessary. And in, uh, from the beginning, the Association of Natural Medicine is uh, something f uh, for the people, for the patients, and also for you here in, in Prague, in Czechia. And uh, therefore, we have every year we have a special topic. And I will bring you tomorrow um, a special topic about the, th the three eyes. What's the difference? And uh, I don't tell what it is, the three eyes, you will listen tomorrow. But it's uh, the political education we need for the patients, because when you want to have patients who know about health, who know about promotion, who know about what is important, you need education and literacy. And most of the patients need our medicine, need the traditional and complementary medicine. And all over Europe, the mainstream medicine system has lo a lot of problems. It's a lot of money problems. All the, the uh, people who are working, the workforce is in problem. But the traditional medicine and complementary medicine is a solution for the future. So, everybody knows every, there's a big need and therefore we need competent professionals. And I think this is very important that uh, 
um, Isabel Wasmuth has told us, we have to think about a broader idea of a professional in this field. It's not only medical, which counts, it's also art, it's social aspect, it's uh, anthropologic aspects and biologic aspects. So we need this for the future and for the development which goes in healthier for the future. So this is a big thing and we need you all to, to bring us up. So it's our choice, it's the people who are doing that. And this is also the, the force of ANMI. We are going on every level and we support collaboration. And even in this uh, context here, we bring in some information and some energy. Okay, that's uh, my... Uh, comment to this and I say uh, Thank you so much for for your um, contribution Nora as a next um, member of the presidium I would like to bring on Dr. Jaivant Pagadji from South Africa, um, the versatile practitioner qualified in Anani Tib, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, Ayurveda, yoga, and many more fields of traditional medicine. Dr. Jaivant Pagadji, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jaivant. Dear Thomas and Presidium members, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be in front of you presenting. Um, I did my studies in Cape Town, South Africa, and I've been to India at Benares Hindu University, and I've completed my Chinese medicine and Yunani medicine degree. Um, today, or at least in the next few days, we're going to be discussing the allied health policy in South Africa to see where, the, where we're currently at. And there's been a great uh, projection, or at least um, I think the number of registered practitioners versus unregistered practitioners and traditional medicine, how it all ties up in our country, we'll, we'll be discussing and exploring. Thank you all so much for the very warm welcome. Look forward to spending more time with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bagadji. Um, and um, I would like to also welcome um, Jasper Oud Madsen <laughs> from Denmark, Danish science Thanks. journalist and uh, <coughs> communication consultant. Thank you very much. Well, uh, <laughs> I wasn't really prepared. I'm not a researcher, oh, yeah. I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist. And actually, I, the journalist should be somewhere out there. But I wonder if there are any. Exactly. That is the issue. Uh, it's hard enough to tell the scientific community that we have a different viewpoint that, and that this is valuable to a broader audience. But still, we need somebody to tell the public and that is really a challenge and that's actually why I'm here because something has to be done uh, it's it's hard enough to get into uh, convince some other researchers academics that this is something which is not uh, some mumbo jumbo pseudoscience it's serious that's hard enough but then you also have to you also have to convince uh, the editors in the media that they shouldn't be afraid to write about this. And it's going to take a while, I know. But we do. I'll tell you about it Sunday. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
And now I think it's time to bring somebody from the Czech Republic, and that will be Dr. Andrea Malkova. Welcome. Welcome to the Congress. She's a general practitioner specializing in myoskeletal and integrative medicine, expert in anthroposophical medicine, acupuncture, and oncological support. Dr. Malkova, welcome. Good afternoon. In our beautiful city of Prague, uh, I would like to welcome everybody, including my colleagues. Uh, um, I'm grateful that they have arrived. As regards uh, our country, the Czech Republic, um, uh, there has always been a great disadvantage for 40 years um, that holistic uh, medicine didn't have enough space within ABM. And in 1990, all boards opened, and uh, and a, a lot of colleagues uh, from abroad started coming. Uh, and uh, without uh, any financial requirements, they supported us uh, in uh, our College of Classical Homeopathy. Uh, and we were supported um, by a teacher's lectures. Uh, um, and then uh, enthusiastic doctors had an opportunity to find out what anthroposophic medicine and uh, homeopathy is. And after 1990, uh, all these methods uh, started to be taught uh, within the, the health ministry and they were certified and acknowledged uh, and uh, at that time we were able to offer these disciplines to our patients uh, in our offices. Uh, however, this gradually disappeared. So this uh, enthusiasm gradually stopped. And we know that homeopathy uh, was excluded uh, from a medical society of Jan Evangelista Porkinje, and uh, a lot of uh, homeopaths uh, became the, the object of ridicule. And uh, uh, a lot of colleagues from um, Switzerland and Germany come here, and they are surprised uh, that there are a lot of women as members uh, of, um, of the Congress. And uh, it seems that um, uh, there is a decline and uh, we can't see a sufficient number of, uh, of colleagues supporting these areas. And I believe uh, this will be also the case of this Congress, that the prestige of integrative medicine will uh, develop uh, and also cooperation with uh, phytotherapy and EBM uh, will start, um, start uh, developing. Uh, these all people are certified, and this is something um, which we like in the Czech Republic, so we really need to make a progress and I believe our patients will be able to address uh, their doctor and choose uh, the way how they want to be treated. Thank you. I thank you very much, Dr. Malkova, for your um, comments and uh, addition. I would like to next uh, invite and welcome Dr. Antoinetta Rozzi from Italy to come join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. Uh, it's uh, an honor for me to be among you. I would like to thank the Dr. Thomas and all the organizers, Dr. Tangavero, for their kind invitation. I am Italian by birth and by heart, but I feel Indian by adoption. <laughs> so my uh, field of research, uh, study, practice is yoga. It's a very ancient science. I would just say three words to define yoga. Unity, integration, and responsibility, which is a new word <laughs> we introduce in yoga. <laughs> Uh, I think these three concepts are very useful in many fields of the life, in medicine, in sociology, in anthropology, in culture. So um, my interest is also in education, because I am a psychopedagogist, uh, and I try to introduce some of these concepts 
in the science of education in uh, Italian universities. It's a hard work, but we started. Because uh, what we need for a brilliant, healthy society in the future is healthy, brilliant uh, people. And yoga deals about every uh, field of personal life, collective life, social life. So I think it could be useful to introduce also this concept in uh, what we call the therapy, even though yoga is not, uh, really speaking, a therapy. Once again, thank you for inviting me, and I am delighted to learn many uh, new concepts among all the members of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Razzi. And, uh, and now I would like to welcome Dr. Paswati Bhattacharya. She's a global integrative medicine leader, expert in Ayurvedic chemistry, holistic health and biodiversity, Fulbright specialist in global public health. And she came to join us from the United States. Welcome. Um, Thank you. This might be better. Um, you don't have to touch anything. I think it's already on. Um, I don't know. This one maybe. It, it should. Work. It should work. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Namaste, Dobreden. Good day to everyone, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Baswati. I'd like you to think about several questions as we enter into this Congress for the next three days. The first question is the hardest one about healing, and that is, why do we hide? Thank you to the members who have brought us together in Prague to the city of tunnels and the largest palace, one of the largest in Europe. Above the surface, we see something very grand, very beautiful, very striking, and very strong. And the city is also full of tunnels. In fact, underneath this very space, there are tunnels from the year 900 of the Common Era. These tunnels would connect people who didn't want to show everyone what the truth is because they were hiding. And what I have learned over the last few days, not only the name Praha, which comes from Pragya Deva and has a deep con uh, connection to Sanskrit, and to many healing systems, the alchemies of the world, and the various medicines of various cultures that have come through this space, this center, which was, in fact, the center of the Western world. But it was also a space where many people hid, and I've been thinking about that for the last few days. Why do we hide? So I learned about the index, and uh, it was very disturbing for me because if you live in the USA, as I do, you never hear about the reality, which I know was true, where people were oppressed, suppressed, and thus depressed, and not allowed to express the wild creativity of their heart. When I walk through your city, what I see is gray, black squares, very somber streets, but they are strong. And what I also see is this flourishing of immense creativity from doorknobs to architecture to the various shops. So there are people that are hiding because they were forced to hide. And they are trying to become creative because it is a way of healing. This is such a parallel to what healers around the world have felt under the hegemony and the force and oppression of mainstream medicine. 
As you may know, I am also a trained pharmacologist at some of the best schools in the world. Neuroscience is my first background. I'm also a modern medical doctor, so I stand in that group of the American Medical Association, the bullies, the people who will, they are the thieves, they are the killers, they are the people who pull power from others. So we are part of that group as mainstream doctors, those of us who are not open-minded. And we sometimes don't see the oppressed. And so as I walk through the city of Prague, I keep thinking about the question, why are we forced to hide? And what does that do to our healing? The second question, and I'd invite you to have that conversation with the others around you. Why do we hide? And what happens to us when we are witnessed for the truth of what we are? Many times there are tears. Many times the trauma can start to heal. But many times there is an embarrassment and shame because Czech went through 44 years of hiding. That's a generation or two. Same in India. My parents lived through partition and the British oppression. And they have put into me... Uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, what that oppression uh, has created. The second question that I invite you to think of is, how do we heal? So the narrative around healing and what is healing needs to change. It is not for people who are only credentialed. I got the credentials, and one of the reasons I got them is because I am always going to be brown, and I'm always going to be a woman. And so to walk through the doors of people who are allowed to be the healers, I had to get the best degrees from the best places. And I represent all of those people who have been oppressed and not allowed to heal. The way that we heal is to change the narrative on what is allowed. So it's not about having degrees, it's about having the competence. There are plenty of people in this room, as I look around, who have an energy around their, their beings. They are healers. They touch others, they listen to others, they move other people in ways that the people can heal. Those are healers. Then there's people who have degrees like me, who sometimes are healers and sometimes are not healers. They're just credentialed people. We need to start asking the question of competence, and we need to start looking at what is evidence of healing, and start to change the policies, change the lawmakers, and help them to understand that the way to heal is actually the way through that door for everyone. Many of you know that the original Jay-Z, who is Joseph Zezulka, had spent time healing some of those oppressionists and that is why he was not murdered. That is why he lived, because he was a healer. So how do we heal? We find people that will help us heal. And sometimes that's not the doctor. Sometimes it's not the one that has the evidence-based medicine. As someone that helps generate evidence-based medicine, I can tell you that the data often don't apply to people. They don't apply to individuals. They apply to averages. And averages are not individuals. The third question is, what is truth? And in Sanskrit, we have a term called satya buddhi. Satya buddhi is actual truth and the intellect to be able to hold that truth and to understand and process that truth. So we have truth in evidence-based medicine, but we also have lies in evidence-based medicine. We have truth when we allow people to walk through the door and see what they're capable of. And that action allows us to see what is the truth of that person. We have the ability to witness people and see what they express. And that is sometimes truth. And the truth, according to the ancient Sanskrit text, is what actually heals. And so I invite you to look at what healing is this weekend. Because after all, this is not the World Disease Congress. This is the World Health Congress. And for those of you who think that the truth of the empire is the WHO, it should possibly not be the World Health Organization. It should be the World Disease Organization until they can prove to us that they understand what health is. And, uh, And 
And I hope that you will challenge all of the speakers to speak about what is health and to really define it. I'll end by saying that I went to a conference of the WHO as a primary care doctor, and behind closed doors, they asked each other, it was about 200 doctors in the room, they said, we don't know how to define health. We only know the indices of what is disease. And they showed a lot of data on hypertension and how to measure hypertension, stroke and how to measure stroke. All the evidence is about disease. And they were saying on the stage, and I won't take names, but they're some of the biggest names in health policy or health care. They were saying, we don't know how to define disease. They don't want to take the Sanskrit definition. They don't want to take the yoga definition. They don't want to take the anthroposophic definition. They don't want to take the homeopathic definition. They want a definition that will allow them to rule, but they themselves are confused. And so this room of healers is needed for us to come up and gather together, make a statement, and put it into the world. What is health and what is healing? I know some of you are sitting and doubting some of what I say, and there are some comments happening. So I invite you to find me in the next three days if you disagree, because as we witness each other, we will heal each other and we will move forward. Thank you for listening to me. It is certainly time for change. It is about finding common path and language between the traditional medicine and the conventional medicine. It is about empathy. It is about truth. I thank you, Dr. Paswati, for your passionate contribution. And as a next uh, member of the presidium, I would like to welcome in Dr. Peter Kat from Germany. Dr. Pat Kat is the president of European Ayurveda Association, lawyer turned Ayurveda advocate, expert in project and conflict management. Please welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, that um, you give me the ability to stand here and uh, to address the people. I will do this tomorrow. As uh, president of the European Ayurveda Association, you might expect me to tell something about Ayurveda, but there are so many people here who know so much more than I do, and they are the experts on the medical aspect of Ayurveda. So we will hear a lot about it. I'm a, also I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor of law. So my Subject is more politics and organization, administration, something like this. This is very important that it is combined with technology. And so tomorrow I will talk about what new technology like artificial intelligence, like JetGPT, can be combined and has to be, has to be combined with the inner voice. With the inner voice, we know and that voice that can help us. That's what I've learned from my teacher, Dr. Balaji Tambe. And um, health is a combination of many elements. But I think one of the most important element is to be together, to combine, to come together. And Thomas gives us exactly the possibility to, give, to do that. We're together here and that we talk about medicine, that we talk about health, that we talk about possibilities to increase health, to increase the well-being of the people. That's all that is needed. Thank you. The politics and the legislation is the necessary vehicle, shall any change take place? Thank you so much, Dr. Kat, for your contribution. And as a next, um, next guest, I would like to welcome Dr. Katarina Wiernitzer from Austria. Um, 
the sports scientist, senior lecturer for sports science and sports uh, didactics. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I wasn't prepared to talk today. Um, Tomasz, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here, not only at this podium, but among such wonderful people with future sighted uh, uh, minds and, and visionary thoughts. So we are united today. Yes, I am not a medical doctor. I am not a medical therapist. I'm just an athlete. I always was until the year uh, my age of 30. I defined myself not as a female. I was an athlete. And the long way to go to here was uh, connecting and, and bringing ties together. So I'm working at the interface of vegan, vegetarian diets, sports, and health. And most relevant to me is how we can translate um, evidence-based uh, data to practical settings. This is rarely done. Most of us scientists, as I'm doing a lot of research and two of my PhD students will join us in the next days, we close the door to our ivory towers and are happy not to be disturbed and uh, do research. And we are thrilled about that. But to me, we have to tumble down the walls. The ivory towers have to fall. We need this um, high-tech uh, research for sure. And we do not know all, but after me, we know enough to start, apply, and translate to practical settings. That's why, although I'm an untamed mind, really, and thinking outside of the box, I am at school settings. So this was my first um, real paid job. I was a physical education teacher. And it is hard with thinking outside the box visions to be at the school setting. But there we have to go. The children are our futures. And we have from the individuals try to shape better public health because health behaviors track over time. So and this is where we have to start. And there are a lot of lessons I will present tomorrow in my talk about is it fact or fiction? We can improve our health ourselves. Do we need so much medicine? Is there a $1 million uh, pill we can get? Or have, do we have to earn health ourselves? So it's all about translating of what we already have, and this is so much we already have in knowledge, and put it into hands-on settings like schools, canteens, playgrounds, uh, playing uh, training pitches. And there is so much to do because there is a big gap and so much potential untapped. So I'm very happy to be here in this um, historic city, in this historic building. Um, I'm happy to meet you and to talk to you in the next days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Virnica, for your contribution. The sports and fitness and research and education is all very important, are important factors um, for well-being and health. Um, so thank you very much. Um, our next um, members uh, that I would like to bring up would be Dr. Kumar Pandey from India. Professor and Head of Sangaharan Faculty of Ayurveda, Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University. Please welcome. Namaste. A very good evening to all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate Mr. Thomas and the whole organizing team to convene such a nice historical event at this very juncture. I'm also thankful to the member of the presidium with whom I'm discussing since last 24 hours regarding this event. My dear friends, when I came to know that 
Thomas is going to organize such a nice event. Then I thought, what the theme is and what the necessity of this theme is. Being a scholar of Ayurveda, I believe for the development of any science for the human beings in three terms. One is the protection from the government or the policy makers. Second one, the scientists, scholars, doctors, physicians, and many more. And third one is the society, the community for which we are going to make a triangle for the better human life. Then the question arises in my mind that why it's so? Why there is a need to come closer to the nature? Because I am happy to see here the expert members of the WHO as well as the yoga sciences. They all have started to think about to come closer to the nature, and nature is our mother. And who is not liking to be closer to his or her mother? To be very healthy, to be very blessed, and to be blessed. According to Ayurveda, the definition of health is, someone saying that, what is the meaning of health is? According to Ayurveda, Samadosha, Samagnesha, Samadhatu, Malakriya. Prasan Atmendriyamana, Swast Iti Abhidiyate. Meaning that the building materials of the body, the metabolic functions inside the body, and the sensory and motor functions of the body, when they are in equilibrium, we feel healthy. And that is only be achieved with the help of integrative, natural, complementary medicine. Not the medicine, that is the approach of living. We have to incorporate all these. So I, my humble request at this very juncture is to the policymakers that this indigenous, complementary, and this traditional medicine must be taught and must be incorporated, must be included in their course curriculum at school age. Then only we can get an early solution, or early the possibilities of the development of the science in any state, in any country, because we are living like a Vasudhaiva Kutumbukam. Each one of us are a family member. We are not in diverse. We are in unite. So I'm really very thankful to the organizers. And tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we will be discussing a lot more regarding the certain issues, how we can develop this very aspect of the life. And the life is with the integrative, indigenous, complementary medicine. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Kumar Pandey. Um, and now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce a short 30-minute break. So please uh, be back at 4.30 p.m. as we have three more members to come and welcome us and in make an introduction. And after that, we will start our panel discussion. Enjoy your break, and I will see you all here at 4.30 p.m. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please come back to your seats. We are going to continue the program. So if you can please, everybody, come back to your seats. Please, everybody, come back to your seats and so we can continue the program. Thank you. Thank you all. I have one technical information about the microphones that we are sharing here all on the tables. They're all turned on. You don't have to touch them at all. No need to press anything. The studio takes care of everything. Um, so if you wish to speak after, after I make an introduction, then you can just take the microphone and speak. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, from the break. Um, we have another guest, another member of the Presidium, who is going to join us online through Zoom. Uh, so I would like to ask the studio for the connection. It will be uh, Mr. Harish Verma from Canada. Hello, Dr. Uh, Mr. Verma. Are you uh, connected with us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much for taking me. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Welcome, welcome to Prague, virtually. Uh, Mr. Verma is the founder president of Canadian College of Ayurveda and Yoga Incorporated in Ontario, president of Best Ayurveda Limited in Canada. So I will give you the space to introduce yourself and tell us something more about yourself. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. First of all, I'm grateful to the organizers of World Health uh, conference at Prague and uh, <clears throat> I'm practicing as an Ayurvedic practitioner in Canada and this is the only country which is right now promoting Ayurveda officially. I'll give you some, uh, I'll give some ideas in my presentation. Let me share my presentation. So I'll start with this uh, quality improvement necessary for regulation of traditional Ayurvedic medicines or Ayurveda practice outside India. So first of all, traditional medicines are recognized by WHO and the definition of traditional medicine is traditional medicine has a long history it is the sum of total, total knowledge, skill, and practices based on theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures. Whether explicable or not, this is very important. WHO accept that if, uh, if, if the medicines are understood or not is not important. Used in the maintenance of health as well as in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement or treatment of physical and mental illness. And Ayurveda, as we all know, is the traditional system of medicine which is recognized as such by WHO. Ayurveda was documented in Sanskrit around 5,000 years ago and is often referred to as mother of all healing sciences. Ayurveda is a complete system of medicine in terms of treatments of acute and chronic diseases, internal and external medicine, dietetics, herbology, psychology, right living, longevity, and rejuvenation. Ayurveda is widely practiced in India and Sri Lanka as a government recognized and regulated healthcare system of medicine. If you look at the potential of Ayurveda, Ayurveda lays great emphasis on preventing the occurrence of diseases and promotion of health. Ayurveda demonstrates an ability to manage acute and chronic diseases. Now the contribution of WHO in global acceptance of Ayurveda. In 2020, the WHO 
started the traditional medicine, Global Center for Traditional Medicine in India, Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi ji and WHO director, they, they performed the groundbreaking ceremony in 2020. And WHO has also generated two very important documents, which is one is for benchmark for training of Ayurveda outside India, and other is benchmark for practice of Ayurveda outside India. And contribution of Canada in promotion of Ayurveda. In 2020, we made a bridge between Government of India, All India Institute of, All India Institute of Ayurveda and the Toronto-based University Health Network to sign a or to sign an MOU, which was signed in the presence of Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji to explore the benefit of holistic medicine practices like Ayurveda. So this agreement is in, <clears throat> in practice now and we are, we are now exploring how we can reach this goal, how we can achieve this goal. <clears throat> we have a organization in Canada, which is called Canada India Foundation. This Canada India Foundation is a national, not-for-profit, non-partisan, non-government organization established with the objective to create a better understanding of new India among Canadians and protect Canadians' interest in India. <clears throat> For the last three years, we are running various Ayurveda lecture series with the help of Canada, <clears throat> Canada India Foundation, Consulate General of India, and various organizations in Europe, UK, US, Canada, and India. And we have done 50 lectures where we, we try to promote traditional Ayurvedic medicines. In, in Canada, Ayurveda is recognized by the federal government. They have issued a National Occupation Code 3232. If you click on Google, you will, if you will put this National Occupation Code on Google, you will find this link, uh, 3232. It is called practitioner in, in Canada. There is a clause called practitioners of natural healing. So all the practitioners of natural healing, whether acupuncturist, aromatherapist, Ayurvedic practitioner, herbalist, homeopath, Chinese medicine practitioner, reflexologist, they all are covered under practitioners of traditional, med traditional healing. Even the Ayurvedic practitioners are covered. And if you look at the regulations of medicines, particularly the Ayurvedic medicines, they are covered under natural health products. And in, in Canada, the pathway of licensing of natural health products as traditional medicine is also there. Now, in Canada, they have <clears throat> regulated Ayurvedic medicines as natural health products and they have made the made some rules. So the requirement of uh, import of Ayurvedic medicine, first of all, there should not be any microbe contamination. So there are limits for the microbial counts for the yeast or E. coli, salmonella. There are limits. And for import of Ayurvedic medicines in Canada, there are limits of uh, microbes even in the topical products. And for imports of uh, Ayurvedic medicines in Canada, there is a limit for mercury, lead, arsenic, and cadmium, the presence of heavy metals in the, in the natural health products. They don't allow any heavy metal in any herbal products. So the limit, uh, limits are like this, the arsenic, the five parts, PPM, cadmium, lead, mercury. So there, 
the regulations are already there for the natural health products and and the prohibited ingredients are not allowed in ayurvedic medicines even the endangered species are not allowed in the ayurvedic medicine for import in canada and animal products are also not allowed in natural health products in canada even the label claims you cannot put any claim that these this medicine is curing curing blindness cancer cataract death, or any disease as we know in us also the fda do not allow any any claim on the label <clears throat> So, <clears throat> as my topic is, there is a lot of uh, improvement required for the regulation of uh, Ayurvedic practice in Canada. When I when we approached the uh, Canadian health authorities, they asked us, "Why shall Canada regulate Ayurvedic medicine when it is so so good for the consumers, so good for the?" people so friendly for the people so this was a very tricky question and they asked they asked us the what are the standards of education so i think now in 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 the congress you can also think of how we can uh, how we can plan that how the standards of how the how we can make the uniform standards of ayurvedic education outside canada and what should be the scope of practice in canada after receiving that education and what are the chances of getting that traditional medicine as such improved by the foreign authority it's like if we want to get approved a uh, our traditional medicines say hingvastik churan or arjuna rest or chandra prabha vati as such nowadays they are allowing single herbs but we want that traditional medicine as such can be approved by the foreign authorities so we should think and we should uh, brainstorm on those lines so this is all about uh, my lecture on uh, improvement required for regulation of ayurveda practice outside india thank you very much thank you very much mr harish verma most of us here at the congress if not all and outside the congress we must agree that ayurveda is not only traditional medicine that has been tested for thousands of years but uh, also a preventative way of living um, life philosophy so i would like to thank you for your contribution mr verma thank you as a as a next um, member of the presidium i would like to invite and welcome dr uwe patas from germany Dr. Uwe Petters is a biologist with focus on physiology, ecology, and pharmacology, and expert in microbiological therapy. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> At first, I have to say, no grat dziękuję, Tomasz. We have heard a lot of wise words in this introduction to the Congress, and uh, I don't want to repeat these ideas. But I want to give you some ideas, perhaps an impulse, which we can take home. And I think this building might be the building we have to think about. If you stay outside, it is a small house. It is a small entrance, but it is a lot of space inside. 
And I think this might be one picture we have to communicate this naturopathy, this integrative medicine, this traditional medicine, this Ayurveda, like you, you like to call it as you want. But we need to have a nice building, a building that we show to the politicians, that we show to the public. This is important, and it must be a nice building. You go, you pass through and you say, okay, this is interesting what might be inside. And the next step is that we have a lot of different ideas. We talk about treatment, we talk about well-being, we talk about uh, cure, healing, all the words, <clears throat> but we have different strategies, different ideas, and we have to discuss it like we do in this Congress. But it is inside the house, and there's place for everyone. We have a lot of rooms, and you can fill these rooms. And we don't, we are not uh, forced to have the same opinion about the strategy, about the therapy. But we can do it, but it is very, very important to stay united for the outside, for the politicians and for the public. And this is, for me, it's the best strategy to stay united outside, to, to discuss all our ideas and vision for the future. And we have a great opportunity at the moment to rebuild natural pussy. Here are sitting so much people with so much force. But important is to have one identity, one vision, and I will give one word in this group. It is vitality. So how to strengthen vitality, how to strengthen the, yes, what is living, what is the power behind living, and that is Perhaps it is a hidden thing for stay healthy and to stay with a healthy life. And I think the Congress might be one step. And I hope you will take this picture from the house home and think about this. This is my idea to come here to Prague. Thank you very much. We thank you very much, Dr. Uwe Petas, for your contribution. And uh, we have two more members of the Presidium that I would like to bring on. And uh, so the next one will be Bruno Diesmont, also from Germany. And uh, Bruno Diesmont from Germany is for Institute of Medical Sciences um, and Please welcome Bruno Diesmont. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry to correct you. My name is Ralf de Simond, and I'm from Germany, and I'm a health practitioner. So I'm a, I'm a practitioner, and the health practitioner is a very special kind of naturopath in Germany. And I will talk to you, to you about the, the role of the practitioner in pre, pre, um, practicing different naturopathy methods on Jijayam in on Sunday. And um, yes, I myself practice homeopathy since 2006, and I'm also a member of the European Council of Homeopaths, and so I'm familiar with the situation of the practitioner in different European countries. It's a very heterogeneous system in Europe. You can practice in one country, in the other country you can't practice because of the legislation, and then you practice under the different legislations in Germany. We have a very comfortable situation with the higher practica because we are accepted by law by the state, so I can practice. This is not a problem for me. And I think this was it for the afternoon, and I'll talk to you more on Sunday. Thank you. <clears throat> I apologize um, to Dr. Ralph Diesmond from Germany, my apologies. 
<laughs> and thank you for for corrections. Um, as a next um, member of the presidium, now it will be Bruno Renzi from Italy, the director of Maharishi College of Perfect Health International. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, first of all, I wish to thank Thomas for the invitation. It's the second year that I am here. It's a great joy to be here in Prague. And also, I wish to thank also the uh, organiza organization team. I would like to emphasize two points. The first thing is that uh, this promotion of health, if we use traditional medicine or an integrated approach, uh, obviously we can treat disease, but the main thing is to create health, to promote health. And there are many, many research that are showing that if we use an integrated approach or if we use traditional medicine, we will observe a, a reduce of cost of hospitalization and also the reduce the cost of the medical treatment. And this is a language that we can use with the government because this is important. This is what they understand. That they are very, they pay attention to the expenses and uh, this is our task is to create health in our patient, to create balance, and to create also collective, collective health. That is not an individual topic, but it's a collective health that is related to the society. The second aspect that I would like to emphasize is that uh, quantum physics is opening new horizon in the field of traditional medicine in understanding the basic principles of all traditional medicines. So, and what we are seeing that the, through the quantum physics knowledge, at the, at the basis of our physiology, or at the basis of the structure and function of the physiology, there is a inner intelligence that is consciousness. Consciousness is at the basis of all our physiology functioning and structure. So there is a new, a new horizon. And uh, in the last year, the last century, in the last century, in the field of neuroscience and psychiatry, so this I am mainly involved with the, in the integration of uh, Ayurvedic medicine in the field of uh, psychosomatics. But what we observed in the, at, the, at the end of the last century, that in the field of neuroscience, the challenge was the understanding of the connection between mind and brain. In this new century, there is a new, a new challenge that is to understand the connection between consciousness, mind, and brain. Because, there, because all the quantum physics is showing that there is this inner intelligence at the basis of our physiology. And I will say you that the next challenge, but I think that it's still now, it's just, it just is right now a new challenge, that in the future we will study the relation between consciousness, heart, mind, and brain. Because the scientific research are, are showing that there is some uh, cardiac brain, a cardiac psyche that, has, that, is, that is in relation and has a great influence on the uh, mental states. So this is our, the future of our, in, in the field of neuroscience and we can give as uh, traditional medicine and complementary medicine, we can give a great contribution to the future of medicine of, and also of, of it, the integrated medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bruno Renzi, for your contribution. And uh, as a next uh, member of the Presidium, I would like to welcome Dr. Raina Pika from Austria, um, Chair of International Maharishi Ayurveda Foundation. Please welcome.
October then. I hope this is some words you can understand, and it's the first few words I have learned from the walk from the railway station to here. It's the first time in Czech Repu that I'm in Czech Republic, and but it already feels like home because I meet so many of friends that I meet all over the world. And the famous Sanskrit word from India, Vasudev Kutumbakam, is kind of a reality, which means the world is my family. So this is how it feels like coming here. And I want to start thanking the organizing committee for inviting me, especially Thomas Pfeiffer and everyone working with him. It's a, a joy to be here, and as I said, I feel like great and home. And um, I think um, uh, I'm coming from the field of Ayurveda. Maybe I should introduce myself because many of you have never heard of me or seen me. I'm actually from Austria. I'm a cardiologist working uh, 12 years in a state hospital in Graz doing angioplasty means angiogram and head of intensive care unit. So I know modern medicine very well. And, uh, but then I shifted my attention to prevention because cardiovascular disease, which is my specialty, they are kind of self-made. It's only 10, 20% that is genetically inherited. So it's a lifestyle disease. And so I thought my thought to my talk to myself saying, why don't I focus my time on prevention so that I don't have to open coronary arteries anymore in, in surgery and, and, and risky procedures. And then I have chosen Ayurveda as, as one of the champions in lifestyle medicine. And um, so my talk that I will give tomorrow will focus on integrating modern medicine and traditional medicine, and especially Ayurveda, since I know both fields now very well. Since 30 years, I'm studying Ayurveda and practicing it. And um, personally, for me, there is no such thing like alternative or complementary. There's one medicine, which is the medicine that is best for any person who seeks for help. So a person doesn't mind what he wants the least side effect, the least problem, the greatest effect. And that can be a, tea, a change in diet, a change in lifestyle, some herbal medicines, some massage, some purification procedures can be use of modern medicine, imaging technology to find out, can be even antibiotic surgery, whatever is needed at the time with the least side effects. And integrating traditional and modern medicine, I think is the future of medicine, at least this is what I'm convinced of. And uh, as Dr. Renzi just mentioned, modern science is slowly approaching more subtle fields like the quantum field theories, they go very well with uh, uh, the theories of consciousness and more subtle fields of medicine. And actually, what I will talk is that modern medicine is step by step discovering traditional medicines. Like, you know, when Ayurveda says oh, most disease coming from the gut, which sounded strange 20 years ago to me, but now with the microbiome research, it's very clear that there's hardly any disease anymore that is not connected with our microbiome. And, so it's the case with many others, with fasting and with uh, autophagy, which is the concept of cleaning up waste. And so all of this comes together nicely. And uh, so I will share some light on this tomorrow. And uh, so again, I'm very happy to be here and looking forward to a wonderful Congress. And I uh, really like to hear all of the champions from all the different countries what they have to say, and hopefully we can join hands to bring better health to the world, which is, I think, is the topic of this World Health Congress uh, for the third time now in a few years. So thank you again for inviting me. I thank you, Dr. Pika for your contribution uh, on what a true patient-centered healthcare needs to look like. And uh, we are looking forward to all of your presentations in the next following few days. Um, and we have a little change uh, here. I would like to bring onto the stage uh, Stefan Hein from the United Kingdom to also introduce himself and uh, make a little contribution. He's a holistic health and well-being practitioner 
teacher and higher ground leadership coach and musician. Welcome. Thank you. If you can please come on the stage. Thank you. Hello. And thank you. Let me take this in. It feels very different to stand up here from and sitting down there. Um, Thomas, thank you so much for this invitation. And um, I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, there were so many people that um, I know from before the COVID lockdowns. I haven't seen you since then. So Amajit, Madan, and some other people. And we met on Zoom calls, of course, during lockdown. And to me, it's very special that I'm here today, coming from London, and I meet you all, and the old team, and the expanded team, um, you know, um, I, I didn't know before, to meet in person. And um, so, yeah, I'm a high practitioner, like Ralph was saying, from Germany, working with complementary medicine and therapies, and with yoga, and with Ayurvedic yoga and meditation, especially my focus, and I work um, with also art therapy and with music in community, the healing aspect of music. My talk about this will be on Sunday. And um, I will also, um, yeah, I would, I would like to highlight here really what a gift it is that we're here together physically. And the thing that has been really coming to my mind lately was as I was going through my own impact of the social isolation, you know, coming out of COVID, that my need for connecting with people really is, <clears throat> is coming forth as a yearning from deep in the heart. And where is that yearning coming from? Where is the yearning to heal come from? We all want to heal, right? And I, I, I really like the yogic and the Ayurvedic and the Siddha tradition from India because they have brought this together in their teachings of the body and the mind and the spirit, right? And there's this ancient wisdom that, that's why I feel at home in yoga because it's that ancient wisdom which I think has gone overboard with the reductionistic scientific view that we have. Um, in our modern age, and which is now giving us a lot of trouble because it's it's hitting, you know, we're hitting with the head against the stone wall and we need new answers. And I think the trend of the um, talks at towards the end, that's really what resonates deeply with me, like Renzi, this is the, con the consciousness aspect, the energy aspect, the life vitality flow of life force needs to needs to come into the conversation that takes us beyond the bi biological modern, the biological interpretation of what reality is supposed to be and what quantum physics is bringing into the equation through the holographic understanding um, of what reality really is and all these refinement of our understanding and how we are able to bring in more and more evidence this, because we have more and more s machines that are able to, to, to measure the subtle movement of life force. Think of EEG, ECG, all these kind of things. Um, I feel that we are heading in a way where consciousness and energy life force is becoming more part of the conversation. So for me and my contribution, um, I discover myself very much, I've gone through a tremendous amount of personal evolution during COVID lockdowns. And I feel I've just, there's so much creativity that wants to come out and express itself. So my tagline for my clinic in London is the medicine of creative consciousness. Okay, for the last 15, 20 years. It actually came into being after speaking to Madan Tankavelu here for a long time. So the medicine of creative consciousness is a body, mind, soul approach to medicine. And there's a portfolio of therapies that I use with my patients in London. And I'm really discovering music now and the power of sound and music to impact our feelings and our subtle bodies, not just the physical body. It has an impact on the biology of the physical body. But we all know when we hear a nice piece of music, 
we, we, we evoke, we emote many feelings yeah, when the music touches us. What is that about music that does that? So for me, that is a very powerful tool to access, um, to, to, to melt away the walls of protection that we have all created around us and the atmosphere of fear that is between us as human beings. There's so much fear out in the world. And I'm asking, what can we do in a setting like this to, first of all, create a spirit of union and oneness with all the different traditions and the specifications that we bring to the table, specialities, experience. Can we create, co-create together a feeling of oneness and union which really reflects that wisdom spirit of yoga. The union is what I feel inside with me, with my higher being. And we all seek that, is my view. We all seek that union within, um, because that gives us deep peace and being at home in ourselves. And I think my, my work is very much about that, and I wish we, we find that union within ourselves and with one another and that we can link up from this spirit of oneness with many different other organizations on the planet. Um, that Because we need to link forces. This is, you know, th we need to create a grassroots movement. As Amajit was saying, we need to really get our voice heard in political circles, and it needs to come from the common people. So that's very much what my work in London is about. And on Sunday, I will introduce you to the, the healing power of sound and music through traditional Indian mantras, which I have researched in the last two, three years in London in a project um, in different therapeutic environments. So um, that will happen on Sunday morning. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I wish you all a very nice conference. I'm certainly happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan Hein, uh, for your meaningful contribution. Stefan Hein is also the member of the Presidium and uh, raising the awareness that we as human beings are not only physical body, but also the mind and spirit is very important. Um, so thank you. And as the next member of the Presidium, I would like to also invite to come up on the stage Dr. Hanna Vanyova from Czech Republic. She is a medical doctor specializing in acupuncture and homeopathy and a former president of the Homeopathic Medicine Medical Association. Please welcome. I highly appreciate the fact that I can be here in the honorable presence of those highly esteemed people from around the world. And I will pursue the idea of my colleague Andrea. After the years of totalitarianism, the Czech Republic has become crossroads of the world's homeopathic schools. Everybody's coming here, really. And uh, I was really uh, uh, absorbing all this information like uh, a sponge. When I started practicing, and indeed since my childhood, I hoped to become a medical doctor, I was quite frustrated by what I could offer to my patients, that I was treating diseases, but in no way do I participate in the creation of health. That was back in the 80s before the Velvet Revolution, and that brought me to acupuncture, which was taught, albeit in a very limited uh, way. After the revolution in 1995, I was lucky to practice in Colombia 
Gbagba in Colombo at Sri, Le Sri Lanka at the clinic of Professor Masuri, and that really opened broad horizons to me. It was extremely surprising for me because my teacher of acupuncture, Dr. Barisheva, put me next to her in a theater, and she was trying to talk me away from homeopathy. She didn't know that it was an effective uh, uh, healing method, so she didn't know about it. And she told me, you're so uh, skilled with acupuncture, so just let go homeopathy and focus on acupuncture only. And it was my surprise when Professor Jayasuriya, during his first contribution told us that he had revealed the great uh, uh, synergy between acupuncture and homeopathy, that if you unite these two methods, uh, the Eastern and the Western thinking is united, both of them being a great uh, uh, heritage of the humanity. So this is really confirmation of my my ideas, and I'm very glad to be able to contribute to it. In 2007, we established, along with my colleague, the Homeopathic uh, Medical Association, and the goal which we set was that every doctor should know homeopathy. It's potential and also its limits because it is a part of, of an integrative medicine. And it must be our credo that each and every patient be uh, given access to the kind of therapy which is the best suited for him or her, irrespective of whether it is a Western medicine or Ayurveda or uh, whatever else. He must get the best. Our third credo was that official institutions should reckon uh, with uh, homeopathy and other complementary, met complementary methods, which should be a part of the official medical care. This, however, for the time being, is not the common practice in the Czech Republic. I do hope that this Congress will contribute to it, because it is organized here in the Czech Republic, in Prague. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanna Vanyova, for your contribution. And we are truly happy that you have stood up for your beliefs and, and found the light at the end of the tunnel during the difficult times of the past political um, regime. And now you are here and you can contribute to this hopefully new beginning of a, of a healthcare uh, in Czech Republic and everywhere else. So, ladies and gentlemen, Put your hands together for our highly qualified members of the Presidium and guests who came here to, from afar to do selfless work. And that work is to come together and pave a much better road to patient-centered healthcare in its truest and deepest meaning. And with that said, I would like to begin our um, panel discussion. I have a couple of questions prepared that I would like to propose. And if anybody would like to react to that and have an answer, if you can raise your hand and uh, take a microphone and answer or contribute to that question. So my question number one would be, how can we, because this has been said from many of you, um, how can we bridge the gap between the traditional and complementary medicine and the conventional healthcare to ensure patient center healthcare if anybody would like to see how can we how can we bridge that gap between these two basically worlds <laughs> how can we come together and uh, also what steps can be taken to promote collaboration and communication between uh, the traditional healers, practitioners, and conventional healthcare providers. 
if anybody would like to address that issue. Yes, Dr. Uwe, Pat. Yes, it is a, a question. And uh, at first, the idea is that we can build the bridge in the technical way. But we don't have any opportunity to build the bridge. The, the bridge has to be built by the patients. They have to ask. They have to yeah, take their freedom, their choice of, uh, of treatment. And in this way, there is a need to communicate because pa patients want to have sometimes both sides of medicine, sometimes only one side of the classical medicine, and on the other hand, the naturopathy medicine as well, only for some diseases. And this is a bridge. The patient is our bridge. And we have to listen to the patient, and we have to give the patient good arguments to say, OK, it is my choice, it is my freedom, and you have to communicate both sides together. It's my opinion that's the right way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the patient is the key. And also, um, probably, we need to educate the public so they have the knowledge of what they even should be asking for. And I also saw Mr. Razzi wanted to uh, contribute if <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bruno Renzi. Okay. Now, I, I would like to take here um, an experience that I had from 2002 to 2012. Uh, we created a psychosomatic center in a public hospital in the university in Milano, that was the Hospital Sacco, in which we integrated for the first time in a public structure Ayurveda in the treatment of psychosomatics. So one way is just to start and to promote this kind of initiative in public uh, institution. And it was easy because uh, there is a part of preventing, preventive medicine that is one part of the, the Ayurveda that you can easily introduce in the treatment of, of your patient, also in public institution. And so this is a way. This is a way in which we can start and we, we, what we can promote just to introduce public in the public the structure, uh, non-conventional and traditional medicine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next was. Does it work? It is yeah. working. Mm -hmm. Just like to add what has already been said very rightly. I think in, in most countries in the world, Western countries, especially in Europe, the population is already wishing to have uh, alternative approaches other than just taking medicines and surgery. So the population is already wanting it, and yet it doesn't happen. So I think it's always a multimodality approach. Um, so we have to convince the established community, which is the modern medicine, uh, with their tools, that means scientific research, uh, to show that alternative approaches and traditional medicines, they do work and they have a scientific basis. If this happens, then we can more easily convince the established medical community to adopt uh, traditional medicines. So this is just some, the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. So basically more research and proof that it is a valid, legitimate way of healing yes, modality yes. that actually truly works. Okay, I think next was Dr. Paswati Bhattacharya. Thank you. This is a perfect uh, segue from what you said, because, I don't need these, uh, because modern medicine is one uh, way that we always say they are the ones in power and they are the established power. But actually, it's not evidence that convinces people. It's never evidence. There's lots of evidence out there. And for anyone that thinks there is not good um, placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials for TCIM, there are. There's lots of evidence in the data, in the published medical literature, in very good journals for acupuncture, for homeopathy, for many modalities. 
what we say is that it's all about BS. Now, I don't know if this will translate from English, but in English, BS is an acronym for bullshit. <laughs> but it is also an acronym for belief systems. And it's really about our belief systems. It's not that I need to see it to believe it. It's that I need to believe it before I can see it. And if you don't believe that something is possible and the only way to see evidence is through pharmacology, um, then you will never be able to see any other kind of evidence. So one of the things that I would like to propose to the answer to this question is that we look at the history of what has worked. If we read history, if we go to the people who really look at the history of science, we will see some things that maybe we were not educated in. When I was in my pharmacology training, I learned that pharmacology is the only way, the best way. And when I asked about non-pharmaceutical herbal medicines that I had seen in Tibet or in China or India, they said, that's all dirty medicine. It's not standardized. And I was taught to believe that unless it's standardized and clean and pure, it's not good for you. But pure does not mean 100% chemically one way. Pure means that which is compatible with the human body. And whether it's water or whether it's a particular herb, it's very important that we understand what is pure. So if we go back into the history of different kinds of medicine, we'll actually find patterns. So life is not a circle. Life is a spiral. And in fact, the Earth doesn't move around the sun in a circle. It moves around in a spiral. And if you don't understand that, go and watch anything in physics and go and read the Surya Siddhanta of the ancient um, Indian texts, and they will say that it's actually a spiral. So if you go and read history, you'll actually find there are a lot of people who are thinkers much before we have come, and that there are many, many truths about this healing and the way to actually bridge between the modern medical and the TCIM practitioners is to look at history where there's a lot of irrefutable objective truth in archaeology and astronomy and preserved elixirs like in, the, in Prague, what we find in the tunnels. If we go to history and put that in the face of the people who are conventional medical, it might help serve a bridge that these things existed before and it's time for you to open your mind that maybe you were miseducated. And I'm saying you meaning me. I was so miseducated when I learned modern medicine. There's so much stuff that doesn't work that it's time for us to put that in the face of modern medicine so that they can be allowed to see, not in a punitive way that we, they are wrong, but to see that there are other ways that historically were possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, history is important, belief system, and education. And uh, we also, uh, I also have Mr. Verma on Zoom, and I would like to take an opportunity uh, for him to uh, contribute to these questions while um, we have a internet connection and he is he's with us. <laughs> and then I will give space to the next. So thank you very much. And I would like to share my experience. <clears throat> Before coming to Canada, I was practicing Ayurveda in Delhi, in India. And I practiced there for, la for at least five, uh, 25 years. The basis of my practice was up to diagnosis, we use modern medicine. And for treatment, we are, we are using Ayurveda strategies, Ayurveda treatments, Ayurveda planning. And I successfully treated, <clears throat> I was specialized in uh, ulcerative colitis, and I successfully treated more than uh, 15,000 patients of ulcerative colitis <clears throat> who were diagnosed with colonoscopy, with the biopsy, with all the modern diagnostic methods, and we treated on the principles of Ayurveda, and we treated those patients who are not getting relief with the, uh, conventional allopathic medicines like sulfasalazine, mesalamide, steroids, biological drugs. They responded very well to Ayurvedic treatment. And after treatment, we sent the patient for again investigations and they found the treatment was very effective even that there were some changes seen in the biopsies. So combination of both 
modern medicine and traditional medicine is an effective way to give relief to the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think next uh, to answer was, from what I saw him raising his hand was, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, um, to establish this bridge, I think it's very important as well to showcase uh, the, the solution because you have many uh, amazing initiatives in the world, but they are not uh, showcased, you know, specifically sometimes by the international community because they are focusing attention on only some very specific things. For example, myself, I have discovered recently an initiative uh, in uh, not just in Switzerland, worldwide. I have discovered worldwide, you have, I am sure you, you are not aware about that, we have 40 living museums worldwide are existing. And these people uh, from voluntary base, voluntary contribution, have decided to complement, you know, the failure of some psychiatric hospital. And uh, for example, in Switzerland, because you have quite um, high uh, universal coverage system, because that is another issue, it is, you know, uh, to complement each other, to, to, to go beyond just the practice of medicine. What does it mean? What, what is the functioning of the full health systems, you know, to allow this bridge as well? That is a, is a key question, you know. Donc here in Switzerland, it's possible to have these people, you know, complement, for example, the lack of, uh, I will say, soft approach to the patient affected by mental health. And what they are doing, they open, in fact, a place where the patient, not just from the hospital, but from, for example, from the cities or the village, have depression. They come free, free of charge because, you know, the assurance take in charge, you know, the, the, the access in this place. And they can do the, uh, perform the art they want. So they are not forced to do anything. They come, and if they feel, you know, uh, it is the time for them to perform sculpture or music or painting, and, and it's very beautiful. And I, um, I would like to invite everybody to visit one day this type of place. You, uh, the, the initiative have started in the US, in New York, but who is aware about that? Who is aware? And the issue it is this access to the knowledge. No, it's not just the bridge. The bridge is existing already, but the people, they cannot see it, you know? No, we, do, we have uh, one journalist with us. <laughs> and uh, where are the, for example, media, uh, positive media today? to report about uh, positive initiative uh, delivered by people, you know, decide to, 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 to amplify creativity, imagination, innovation, and not just negative thought. That is really the question mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I agree with that. And um, we have, we don't have actually any time left. <laughs> But um, I would like to still take the opportunity to hear what Nora Laubstein has to say to the yeah. question. And For me, it's interesting when you want to build a bridge, what kind of bridge you're building? What's the riversides? Who want to build a bridge? Who is building the bridge? Who gives the money for the bridge? what uh, kind of material you use for your bridge, what's the conditions, who should pass the bridge, who is allowed to pass the bridge, who will conquer the bridge. So these are the questions for me about a bridge. Not more, thank you. Unfortunately, 
our time for today has been already fulfilled. <laughs> there will be an opportunity to address some of these questions um, during the presentations during the next few following days. Um, but before we all leave, I'd like to gather everybody who has received an invitation via email for tonight's activity to please uh, transition to the restaurant located on the lower level. You can use the staircase. There are two staircases, one through the main hall, one through the um, hall number two, um, or an elevator. And yes. OK. <laughs> there will be a meeting with uh, Mr. Tomasz Pfeiffer. And um, for everybody else, I would like to wish everyone good night. Uh, we will meet again tomorrow when the presentations will begin at 9 a.m. Um, so we will see you then. Thank you very much. And I believe yes. Tomáš would like to speak up. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, uh, from the Presidium of the Congress. I would like to thank all the viewers. And I am looking forward to our next Congress session tomorrow, uh, when we will be able uh, to hear a lot of useful information. Uh, a bridge uh, is built from the material which is available. Sometimes it might be wooden sticks, sometimes it might be logs, and sometimes it might be metal, and sometimes it's a mere soil. Uh, but we have to use what is available, and we have to start working. We must be on the right place uh, at the right time. We must be patient. We must not to uh, expect too much, but at the same time we must uh, hope. And therefore, I look forward to our next Congress session tomorrow.